So we are um, continuing our journey through Luke's Gospel, the series of things that make Luke unique. And um, I want to point out a couple of, of these because uh, I get asked all the time, isn't the Bible a misogynistic book? And I always reply the same way. No, it's not. It's in its time frame, in its first century context, you can, I find that the gospel um, and the message within scripture pushes some serious boundaries um, that the first century world experienced. And certainly that's true in Jesus's estimation, trust, and interaction of women in, in the ministry, which is reflected in Luke's gospel probably more than any other. And so I want to look at a couple of these passages. Um, the, the first one I want to look at is uh, Luke 8, 2, uh, with Mary Magdalene. Luke 8, 2. And you should have your own text. Um, I've got a bunch of texts here. Here is my handy-dandy Greek text. Got that one. I have a number of them back on the shelf that, uh, that, uh, but I have also the electronic version, the one that you're looking at now. So you should have your copy too. Um, look at what it says in Luke 8, 2, as uh, talking about the mission soon afterwards, and this is in verse 1, he went through cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, and look who's included in the 12. Keep in mind the chapters and verses, that, that verse 2, where the comma is, and the chapter 8, these are included uh, late in the production uh, of the Gospels. Um, of course, they have some traditional uh, value, but if you read this all at a piece, the 12 are included with this next verse, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. And then the listing, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward Chutza, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. So look at how these women are privileged right alongside of the 12. They will function as supremely important, as we learned um, from, by looking at the crucifixion narratives and the resurrection stories, that in the resurrection stories, it is these the, the women who figure prominently. And uh, the epiphany stories, when we start to look at those um, epiphany stories in another couple of sessions, you'll be able to, to see the prominent role that these women played. Um, consider this passage from uh, Mary and Martha uh, from Luke chapter 10. Uh, N.T. Wright, the prominent um, New Testament scholar, you, can't, you really can't go wrong with uh, N.T. Wright. How about that? That should be a slogan or something. I don't even get any credit for that. Um, but this is a story. Uh, notice also in the heading, it doesn't have, uh, so this is a unique story to Luke. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. And so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. In this passage that Luke records, Mary is given the incredible opportunity um, of being a student. And by sitting at Jesus' feet, Mary had adopted the posture of a rabbinic student. And Jesus does not take that gift away from her, doesn't take that away from her. This is a role that no woman would be able to, to maintain, and yet Jesus privileges Mary. Um, and of course, Martha's role uh, as the one who's preparing is not to be diminished either, but it's simply to say that Mary has will be able to maintain this role uh, as a student. Let's look at uh, this last one here, uh, Luke twenty three fifty five. Luke 
So the women who'd come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. So already women are at the tomb, and they're functioning within the narrative framework of Luke's gospel to, to, be, uh, to be those who are kind of in the background, but yet maintain a critical role. Um, and then you look at what happened. First day of the week, um, they found the stone rolled away. Who are they? They return, prepared spices. These are the women. The women are the ones who continue. They found the stone rolled away, and they didn't find uh, any body. That the two men in dazzling clothes, maybe angels, they, the women are terrified, bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. So the women have a prominent role. Mary, Magdalene, Joanna, mother, Mary, the mother of James. This uh, is probably Mary... The mother of Jesus as well. Uh, James, of course, this would more likely be the brother of Jesus that is the leader of the Jerusalem church when we find him again in Acts chapter 15, and also the James that the epistle is named for in the back of the New Testament. This is this is that Mary and 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 that James. And so um uh they didn't, they didn't believe the disciples at first, and, uh, and then um, we have the epiphany stories. So incredibly, women were not treated as equals in terms of the court of law for a witness at a trial or for other legal proceedings, and yet the gospel writers all entrust the characters of the story, the women who are featured in the story, as critical to the drama and, in fact, essential to it. Uh, so Luke privileges women in a, in a way that the other Gospels don't. Another aspect of Luke's Gospel that's unique is the way that Jesus prays. All the Gospels show Jesus praying um, in the Garden of Gethsemane after feeding the 5,000. But there are a couple of other places that Luke chooses to emphasize. The baptism, uh, which is the first conflict. Uh, so the baptism in three, the first conflict in five, choosing the 12 before predicting his suffering and death. So uh, all of these, and included here are the parables about prayer. Luke has some kind of an emphasis about prayer that he considers important. The parable that we saw, the, the, the one about the midnight, uh, the unjust judge in the, a couple sessions ago, where the person just bangs on the door, how that's a, uh, like a teaching moment for prayer. Um, I have people that have been praying for something for 12, 15, 20, 40 years, and, uh, and my encouragement to them is the same, and that is based on this parable. Um, keep on praying. Uh, make, your, make your petition known to God. Um, Luke emphasizes the praise of God. The function and the agency of the Holy Spirit also is more prominent. There are double the references here, and this prepares the way for, for Acts, for instance, when you look at uh, acts and the vibrancy of the Holy Spirit in that um, in that respect. So Luke is a gospel written for and intended to point to the Gentile mission. This is a, a, in direct, a direct line to the Apostle Paul. Luke is writing history. He's trying to put together an historical record, um, at least from his point of view, and, and he does get some things mixed up. We didn't have time to talk about the census and the birth narrative, and there are certain elements of the story which Luke probably doesn't get exactly right. But his intention is to put together a story that will then be bridged to get to, um, of course, the book of Acts and the early church. So this gives you a really quick overview in these last segments about the unique features of Luke's gospel. And I want to turn our attention next to the to how these two uh, gospels, Matthew and, and Luke, uh, how they interact with Mark. And to do that, I'm going to look at the four source theory, which I have a uh, one slide I'm going to show you in just a second. So this is the, um, the four source theory. Uh, and you can see um, the presentation there, it's just one slide, the four source theory. And what I like about it is the pie chart aspect that you can see uh, the different aspects and um, uh, you know, you can get it. So let's talk about what you're seeing and, and how it makes sense. Um, okay, so the purple parts, Matthew, Luke, and Mark. 
these this basically is Mark incorporated into Luke on the one hand and Matthew on the other. So you see that 76% of Mark's gospel is included in Luke and Matthew. They hold it in common. 41% of Luke is Mark. 45% of Matthew is Mark. So um, now there are parts of Mark that, that end up popping into Luke. Only 1%, though. That's the, that's the um, you know, this figure. And then and the one, I'm not sure if you can see that or not. And then um, Mark and Matthew, on the other hand, shares another 10%, which is 18% of Mark. So if you just do the math real quick, 18 plus 76 is, you know what that looks like, right? And then, and then another 3% of Mark. So that is only 3% of Mark's gospel doesn't get incorporated into Luke and Matthew. So that has to be explained somehow. And the only way we can, I mean, make a reasonable run at it is to suggest that both Luke and Matthew have some version of Mark in front of them as they put this together and they use it as a source. Almost like if you were writing a research paper and needed a source material and you had it sitting here and you could kind of type off it. In the ancient world, they didn't quibble over who wrote what. They wanted to know what was true. If it was true, they turned around and used it. So Luke and Matthew esteemed Mark's version to the point where they use it. Now, Mark's language, as we said, rugged. His Greek is terrible. It's a quick moving, fast paced really ramping it all up until you set, until Jesus sets his face to Jerusalem, then it slows down. Um, you've got lots of miracles, uh, abbreviated, but there are parables. The parable of the sower is the most important. But basically, like uh, people have said, it's an extended, uh, it's a narrative. It's a, it's a passion story, right? Passion story is the last week of Jesus' life. That story with an extended introduction. But let's look a little further into the problem. And um, so once again, the purple elements, the Mark, Luke, and Matthew share is called the triple tradition. But look just below that at the blue material. That's called the double tradition. This is stuff that Luke and Matthew share that does not find its, uh, as you can't find it in Mark. And I, I have a little example here. On the one side um, right here, this is Matthew, his version, and then Luke's version, only two verses. So you can see that here we've got five verses and here we have two verses, but I want to point out that which they have in common. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear bad fruit. So here it is, verse 18 is, in, is a direct copy, right? And then uh, each tree is known by its fruit, right? Thus you will know them by their fruits. Uh, so you get a sense of which, and look, Mark, it, it doesn't appear in Mark. Now, there are all kinds of things like that, um, and we're going with Matthew's designation right here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, and then here, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Um, and then um, here, you, here you have the part, I never knew you, go away from me, you evildoers. I do not where, know where you came from. Go away from me, all you evildoers. Somehow or other, somehow or other, Luke and Matthew, this has to get explained somehow. Just like the prevalence of the Mark and material it seeks an explanation. So what is the, what is the explanation that most people uh, choose? Blue material here, how do you explain that? Scholars will explain that by alluding to a source called Q. Now, we looked at that earlier when on the Luke presentation, and the, the word Q, the letter Q, comes from the German word Quelle, Q-U-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, which means source. It's a hypothetical source of Jesus' sayings that both Luke and Matthew incorporate within their Gospels, representing nearly a quarter of the content in each of those Gospels. And you can go through, it's not simply a matter of borrowing. We're talking about a whole scale matchups. So scholars will interpret this material as representing, representing a, an independent Q source. The other materials that you find with these three gospels, material unique to Luke, 